Hello. In 1996, TSR would release one of its least popular reinventions, a game that would alienate Dragonlance story fans and AD&D roleplayers alike. But was Dragonlance Fifth Age really one of TSR's greatest mistakes? Or was it a bold experiment ahead of its time? I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're chronicling the cataclysmic history of Dungeons & Dragons Pariah, Dragonlance Fifth Age. When I first started roleplaying, I mostly played my friend's games. My good friend Rob had a huge collection of D&D and Star Wars RPGs, so I didn't really need to own anything myself. Eventually though, I wanted to start my own collection, and one game that bit me hard was Dragonlance Fifth Age. I tried to read a bit of Dragons of Autumn Twilight in the school library once, I maybe got 20 or 30 pages before my short attention span just stopped me, but that meant that I wasn't that familiar with the world of Kryn and the Dragonlance characters. And I also didn't own any AD&D already, which kind of made me the perfect customer for Dragonlance Fifth Age, because this new game was able to alienate AD&D fans, Dragonlance readers, and people who didn't like cardboard boxes. So how did TSR end up in such a mess? Well, it's quite a long story. By the time Advanced Dungeons & Dragons had hit its second edition in the late 80s, it had become firmly established as the greatest role-playing game available, or at least the most famous, and it had already found homes in some of the campaign settings that still play host to gamers the world over today. Following Greyhawk and Forgotten Realms, the third campaign setting was Dragonlance. Created by Tracy and Laura Hickman, successful TSR designers who had already had a hand in creating the Ravenloft campaigns, and several other adventure modules. After pitching a story intended to elevate the fearsomeness of dragons once again, the Hickmans were encouraged to develop the story further, teamed up with TSR game editor Margaret Weiss on what was then termed Project Overlord. The plan was for Tracy Hickman to create a novel and three AD&D adventure modules, but as the pieces started coming together, the ambition grew, and the Dragonlance Chronicles would crystallise as a trilogy of novels and 14 linked adventure modules with a couple more modules released afterwards to further explore the world of Kryn in which the story was set. Unlike other campaign settings, Dragonlance would take the stories and characters from the novels as its guide. The first novel was written alongside the first three modules, but this was too constraining for Hickman and Weiss, and the rest of the modules were written after the books had been completed. The idea was that the players would take on the role of the heroes from the books and play through the same events, reliving the epic moments and getting the opportunity to make some different decisions. Though the rails were not too forgiving throughout the campaign, and you could only diverge so far, the series was a massive success, and the novels became an institution in their own right. There are somewhere in the region of 200 Dragonlance novels now, and there's more on the way. However, as AD&D added more and more campaign settings, and TSR the company continued to struggle, the decision was made to end many of the game lines in 1993. Dragonlance was no more, at least at the gaming table. Weiss and Hickman had followed up on the Dragonlance Chronicles with a second trilogy, the Dragonlance Legends, in 1985 and 86, as well as writing supplemental material for the game world, like Leaves from the Inn of the Last Home, in 1995, two years after the end of the DL campaign setting. Weiss and Hickman were asked to produce a third trilogy of books, set to begin with the Dragons of Summer Flame. At the same time, a new development team was brought together to begin work on a new game that would be set in the Dragonlance campaign setting, but things would not go smoothly from here on out. Whilst Weiss and Hickman were working on Dragons of Summer Flame, plans at TSR changed, and much to the chagrin of the authors, that new trilogy was cut short. All of the story of the Great Chaos War was to be condensed down into a single book, which would be published in November of 1995. The events of that book, that were originally going to be an epic final trilogy, are both shocking and conclusive. Characters die, gods leave, magic ends, the moon and stars are missing from the sky. This is all but the end of Kryn as we have known it. The development team working on the new Dragonlance game, what would become known as Dragonlance Fifth Age, were left in an unusual position. Sue Wineline Cook, the first game editor to join the Fifth Age design team, said in an interview a few years later that the team were surprised at the turn of events seen in Dragons of Summer Flame. That feels like 
an understatement to me. <laughs> the game was not developed with foresight of this complete upending of the order of the Dragonlance world, but rather in reaction to it. For a game series that success had been built on following the story of the novels, things were looking dicey. Follow the story closely and your players will have nowhere to explore and nothing to do except die in an epic final conflagration. Diverge from that story and face a loss of credibility and canon wars. In more recent times, Margaret Weiss has described Dragonlance Fifth Age as being somewhat controversial. I think that's quite an understatement. The game would divide fans, and I am not surprised in the least. They were given a very odd starting point, and there was more than one decision that was going to take this game into territory many people didn't want it to go. Dragonlance Fifth Age would move the story of Kryn forward by 30 years. This would place it deep in a new era in Kryn, the Age of Mortals. A time when old magic had faded with the gods and the moons, and new sorcery and mysticism was beginning to take root. Dragons had become rarer, but those that could be found were colossal beasts that act as overlords of entire continents and new characters have taken up the mantle of their forebears, as the surviving heroes of the Lance have grown older. Sue Wileen Cook, who would go on to become the brand manager for the Saga System games, believed that Dragons of Summer Flame gave the design team an interesting jumping off point, and that lead designer Bill Connors took the disappearance of the gods as a challenge. Together, they wanted to create something fresh, even whilst capturing what made Dragonlance Dragonlance. Designer Steve Miller said that he felt Dragons of the Summer Flame was a fantastic waste of potential. So, in the products that he had major input on, he tried to strike a balance between drawing on elements of classic Dragonlance that still had room for growth and development, whilst moving the world forward into this new age. Connors was also eager to include the largest dragons ever seen on the face of Kryn, bigger and badder than anything that had come before. Released in 1996, the core box for Dragonlance Fifth Age is, I think, an absolutely gorgeous product. It's wonderful, it's designed to look like this aged tome, and inside the box you get a couple of smaller digest sized books. Book 1 provides the rules of play, character creation, a bestiary, and how to DM the game. Book 2 offers insight into the world of Kryn as we find it now in the Age of Mortals, and the older history of the world. A map of the new world of Kryn is also provided, and this would mark the standard structure for the first wave of releases for Fifth Age. Each would come in a book-like box, with new rules in one book, new history in another, and a map of relevant parts of the world. Each would also include a third book, presenting a part of the Heroes of a New Age campaign our epic new story set in the Fifth Age, and running parallel to the new series of Dragonlance novels. This homage to the DL modules of AD&D was a nice spiritual successor, allowing players to follow the story that was unfolding in that latest trilogy of novels. These new novels, The Dragons of a New Age Trilogy, were written by an author new to the Dragonlance world, Gene Raab. Raab had joined TSR in 1987 as a coordinator for the RPGA Network, TSR's Organised Play Association, as well as being asked to edit D&D and Gamma World modules as well. Whilst with TSR, Raab authored several novels and articles and edited the Battletech magazine Mechforce. In 1993, Raab designed the Kryn Space module, a crossover supplement that brought the Spelljammers to the worlds of Kryn. In 1995, Rob was asked to write the new Fifth Age novels for Dragonlance, and the approach taken to developing the story mirrored and then advanced on the way that those original Dragonlance Chronicles and modules had been composed. As the Dragonlance Fifth Age game was developed, it influenced the way Rob was writing the novels, and vice versa. Neither came first or took precedence. Designer Steve Stan Brown described the approach. This was the first time that books and RPG products were developed concurrently. We worked very closely with Jean through memos and sharing drafts of the manuscripts. A particular example that Stan called out was how the different game systems representing sorcery and mysticism in the game were incorporated into the descriptions in the novels. But what of the rules? This was not a simple setting for AD&D. This was a new game system entirely. Dragonlance Fifth Age 
would use the new Saga system. Described as a dramatic storytelling game, the intention was for this new rule set to emphasise narrative gameplay, dramatic scenes and roleplay led adventures. It was an effort to mimic the epic stories of the Dragonlance novels, to move away from pure hack and slash dice rolling into something more driven by the needs of the story and the collective storytelling of the players and the DM. So, as if leaning into the decimation of Kryn and its gods wasn't controversial enough, Dragonlance Fifth Age would abandon the one thing that was best friend to D&D players for the past 20 years. This game doesn't use dice. The Saga system placed storytelling at its very heart. To further emphasise this, the DM was renamed the Narrator. The Saga System's designer, William Bill Connors, was a long-time legend at TSR. Connors contributed to many of the monstrous compendiums and wrote the Ravenloft Compendium in 1991. It was Connor's idea to build this new storytelling rule set around the Fate deck. Player agency was found through the use of this deck and the choice of which card to play in order to attempt actions. Rather than roll a dice, players simply played a card from their hand, added the number to their ability score. If it was high enough to better the difficulty, then the action was a success. Throughout the game, each player would hold a hand of cards, so they could be tactical in when to use their high cards. If you're not too worried about the consequences of for failing a certain check, then maybe you want to use a lower card and get it out of your hand. Or perhaps you want to guarantee a positive result. So you play your highest card just in case. I love this system. It does exactly what Connors and the design team wanted it to do. It makes the storytelling feel like it's a part of the game. If you need to succeed, you can play the right cards to ensure that you do. But there's still randomness because you're drawing your hand from a deck. You don't just have infinite successes available to you, you've still got to play the game, but when it matters for the story, you can ensure things happen, or you can build out your failures in a way that's narratively satisfying. And if you like that system, and I really do, then the magic rules are awesome. Sorcerers and mystics weren't restricted by a list of spells. They could attempt anything. If a scene called for a specific magical effect, then the player could describe what they wanted to achieve and the narrator could work out the difficulty of the spell right there and then, based on its impact in the game. This made magic feel like it could really do anything. Because it could. You could be as inventive as you wanted. And with an effective narrator, it wasn't overpowered because difficulty was balanced against the effect of the spell. Now, it's true that working all of that out could slow the game down, but once you got the hang of it, it was incredible. And beyond the mechanics of the game, the structure of its adventures was a step removed from classic Dungeons & Dragons as well. Adventures were designed to be story-driven, and were structured not around map-keyed monsters, but dramatic encounters and scenes, with notes provided on atmosphere and events. The narrator and the players were expected to collectively tell the story of their heroes and their travels and trials, in a way that, at the time, was not that common. In the past few years, games like Vampire the Masquerade and White Wolf's wider World of Darkness had pioneered storytelling games that took the pressure off the purely mechanical adventures favoured by some, and Fifth Age was attempting to embrace that shift. Modern game systems like Powered by the Apocalypse have absolutely advanced this even further, but at the time, I think it's arguable to say that this approach was on the fringes of gameplay. It wasn't mainstream yet. The first four dramatic supplements for Fifth Age would be character class splat books. Up first was Heroes of Steel by Ralph Skip Williams, which would tackle the warriors of Kryn. Williams had actually been a veteran of D&D adventures run by Gary Gygax himself, and he had gone on to work at TSR on an enormous number of D&D products. The second supplement was Heroes of Defiance by Steve Miller. Miller had previously worked on Ravenloft and would return to the Fog Shrouded world. This set would deal with rogues and, despite being written alongside the Warriors supplement, it would actually be delayed by more than six months, due in no small part to TSR's ongoing bankruptcy worries. But like the heroes it covered, the box would be defiantly released anyway. The third box was Heroes of Sorcery by Stan, covering the magical heroes of Kryn. Stan would go on to work on an impossibly long list of TSR and Wizards of the Coast projects, including a range of D20 modern releases. And finally, there was Heroes of Hope by Dwayne Maxwell, which detailed the closest thing to a cleric you could find in the Fifth Age, the Mystics. 
Maxwell worked on books for Birthright and Forgotten Realms, as well as the broader world of Dragonlance Fifth Age. Each of these splat boxes would include new and expanded rules, history, and an adventure in the continuing Dragons of a New Age story. Writer Skip Williams would also tackle a legendary figure and a legendary place in The Last Tower, The Legacy of Raceland Supplement. This box, which actually came out in the middle of those splats, would focus on the last remaining tower of high sorcery, the Tower of Wayreth. In it, you would find a treasure trove of magical history, trinkets, traps, and travelogues. And if you wanted to gain access to another Fate deck, you could also buy the separately released Fate deck pack. Though, perhaps unfairly, these decks were randomly bundled with one of four different one-page scenarios. The Haunted Amulet, the Dwarven Crown, Death on the Deep, and the Duntalic Run. You'd have to buy four copies and get very lucky if you wanted them all. In all this time, I still haven't found a copy of the Duntalic Run. <laughs> it's painful. As with other TSR games of the era, Dragonlance Fifth Age received some great support from Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine, with several new characters, creatures, locations, and adventures being published. The RPGA network also released a series of adventures, one of which was included in the TSR Jam Book in 1999. Sadly, that would be the only anthology of RPGA adventures published at the time, and as they were often just A4 printouts, most have been lost to all but a few forward-thinking collectors. 1998 would be a bumper year for Fifth Age, with the release of some of the best supplements that the game would ever see. Palanthas by Stan would allow players to walk the streets of the ancient city that had survived the many great wars relatively untouched but in the Age of Mortals, it had fallen on the oppressive yoke of the Knights of Tachysis. Unlike most of the other accessories for the game, the Palanthas expansion would be a single book, but it would still provide a wealth of information for a new setting within the world of Kryn, story hooks, maps, and history. A new additional rules book, A Saga Companion, would provide expanded, revised, and optional rules to build upon the best parts of the saga system, and give players infinitely more freedom in how they played. Written by Connors, the companion was literally a game changer. Rules clarifications, new character creation options, more support for narrators, it offered a huge upgrade to the game. And it wasn't even the best supplement that came out that year. It was another Stan book, The Bestiary. This book was a delight, featuring beautiful illustrations, a broad range of new animals, monsters, and unusual beasts. The Bestiary is more of a storybook than a monster guide, full of wonderful details and rich world building, written as if from the perspective of Caramon Magier. And yes, I know there are more formal pronunciations of that name, but I just prefer to hear it that way. <laughs> These were joined by two new boxed expansions, Steve Miller's Citadel of Light, which would introduce a new center of magic and learning, and Douglas Nile's Wings of Fury box set, the epic conclusion to the Heroes of a New Age campaign. Wings of Fury would match the ending of the novel trilogy and provide further direction for continuing the story beyond it. It would also feature a host of new rules and details on the draconians and dragons of this new age in Kryn. With Wings of Fury, the final foundations for the Fifth Age had been laid, and Citadel of Light was an attempt to move forward the meta plot for this new world, introducing key new characters like Mina, Gold Moon's adopted daughter. But Mina's story and those of the wider Fifth Age setting, such as the newly introduced Afflicted Kender, a group of Kender who were deprived of their wanderlust and lightheartedness after the destruction of their homelands, would never be completed. Mina was supposed to take center stage in the Fifth Age's eventual return of the gods, with weighty decisions to be placed in her hands. She would go on to be an important part of the wider Dragonlance narrative, but not in the same way that Miller and co-creator Dwayne Maxwell had originally planned. But all of that great material may already have been too late. In 1997, TSR had been laid low by a series of disastrous business decisions. Wizards of the Coast, high on four years of exponential Magic the Gathering growth, stepped in and bought the company, and they immediately set about a campaign to win back the favour of industry artists and creators. The TSR change to the Dragons of Summer Flame trilogy had caused a falling out with Hickman and Weiss. But, after mending bridges, the team at Wizards wanted to bring the authors into the fold once again. One such act of outreach came in the form of a series of Dragonlance summits that would change the course of history in Kryn. 
putting authors, game designers, and TSR book reps around a table to plan the future for the game line and fiction series. Existing plans and character arcs were scrapped, and the ideas for The War of Souls emerged. A new trilogy to be written by Weiss and Hickman and released between 2000 and 2002 would restore much of what had been lost from the world of Kryn. A new set of supporting game resources were also planned. The series of Battle Lines adventures would advance the Fifth Age story and set the stage for The War of Souls to come. Shortly after the Winter 1997 summit, a new newsletter focusing on the behind-the-scenes happenings with the DL line was conceived by Sue Cook. The Legends of the Lance newsletter provided candid interviews with the creative team, new background, and new rules, locations, and encounters. Initially, the newsletter was published in print and mailed out to fans, but it would become an online-only publication by issue 6. And this was not Cook's only digital innovation. She would go on to pioneer the concept of web and enhancements for physical releases, with bonus content and website support for a range of Wizards of the Coast publications. It was in issue 4 of the Tales of the Lance that the first public announcement would be made about the new War of Souls story, and the foreshadowing of impending doom for the Fifth Age game. Meanwhile, looking at the saga system from the outside, you might have assumed all was well. Reviews for the Fifth Age had largely been positive. It even won the Games Magazine Adventure Game of the Year award in their 1997 Buyer's Guide issue. And TSR sold at least one copy of the core box in the Manchester model shop to a little Jordan sorcery. Elsewhere, the new Marvel Super Heroes Adventure Game would also be based on the Saga system, using a new copy of the Fate deck to tell comic book action adventures. In 1999, Dragonlance would celebrate its 15th anniversary as part of the broader 25th anniversary celebrations for the original Dungeons & Dragons release. Several D&D classics would receive updates and reprints, such as Ravenloft and White Plume Mountain. For the Dragonlance release, it would be a single volume that reworked the entire War of the Lance. Steve Miller and Stan rewrote the first 14 DL modules, refocusing gameplay around the new Fifth Age style encounters and refining storytelling and decision points throughout. Some big locations from the story, like the ruins of Istar, were sacrificed, but the entire thing manages to fit in a single book, even as it provides rules for both the saga system and AD&D. And what of that dual stat approach? It might seem like an innocuous decision to honour the original modules, but unfortunately for the Fifth Age, it presaged something darker. As plans gathered pace to move beyond the New Age, detailed in Gene Rubb's trilogy of books and the Fifth Age supplements to this point, Wizards decided to revisit the last book by the original DL authors. And so, the Chaos War in which Dragons of Summer Flame takes place became the backdrop for reprinted and new fiction tie-ins released under a Chaos War series label. And two new adventures were written, Seeds of Chaos and Chaos Spawn. But it wasn't the return to an earlier era of the lore that was the most startling decision with these supplements. They returned to the earlier rules as well. Both were published as AD&D supplements, the first DL AD&D books since 1993. And the adventure structure followed by all Fifth Age modules to this point, with acts and scenes and other flourishes emphasised by the dramatic roleplay system, being abandoned in favour of more traditional adventure writing. Although they included conversion rules for the saga system, this clearly demonstrated that the age of saga was coming to a close. In 1999, a further adventure, one of the battle lines, was the Sylvan Veil. Vale. Originally conceived as an incremental step forward in the Fifth Age plot, Sylvan Veil vale was reconfigured to be a full prelude to the upcoming War of Souls trilogy. It centres around the Sylvanesti Shield, a magical protection around the forest of the Sylvanesti Elves, powered by an ancient and seemingly corrupted sentient shield tree. This adventure and the next were published as Saga System Supplements, but after the seeming success of the Chaos War modules, it was decided that they would include conversions for AD&D. The cover design even emphasises AD&D over the saga system, and the binding was a return to classic D&D publications, rather than the digest size that had been favoured for Fifth Age. The Rise of the Titans was the second Battle Lines adventure, published in 2000. It covered the foreshadowing of the role of the Ogres and Titans in the War of Souls. Ironically, 
That material was actually cut from the trilogy, and the Ogre Titans wouldn't be relevant until the following novel series, the Minotaur Wars trilogy in 2003, which were written by Richard Knack. This was the final Battle Lines adventure, and indeed the final Fifth Age support of any kind. On March 24, 2000, Steve Miller announced online that Wizards were ending the Dragonlance Fifth Age series. He described it as Strike 2, the second time the Dragonlance line had been cancelled in its entirety after that 1993 decision to end AD&D support. He said that sales had not been strong, and he warned fans that they would not be seeing any new Dragonlance material for some time. In another recent tweet, Margaret Weiss mentioned that Fifth Age had not sold especially well, and though it was hard to find any specific figures, it doesn't feel surprising that that may have been the case. The design team for Fifth Age were asked to pull off not one miracle, but three. They had to reboot a beloved franchise whose legendary authors had left it burning, distance the game from AD&D with a completely new and forward-thinking rule set, and work in the shadow of the most tumultuous and ultimately terminal period in TSR corporate history. It's no wonder the game was divisive. And through all of that, the creative team produced a set of game materials that are gorgeous, smart, creative, and forward-thinking. In the right hands, the rules can help players craft expansive and innovative stories, moving adventures far beyond the constraints of dungeons and combat towards the Tolkien-esque epic sagas that the Dragonlance world always aspired to. Mechanically speaking, I think that this is the closest you can get to a truly narrative-driven Dungeons & Dragons game in the world of Kryn. Now, the setting itself was admittedly a tougher sell. With so many iconic elements of Dragonlance taken off the table before they even got to play with them, I think it's fair to say that the Fifth Age team were able to create an interesting world in which to tell Dragonlance stories. As well as the writers that have made Dragonlance an immersive and exciting world in which to spend time, the artists are owed considerable praise too. Alongside D&D legends like Larry Elmore, Keith Parkinson, Clyde Caldwell and Jeff Easley, Fifth Age featured tremendous art from a huge number of talented artists and designers. Despite this, as a sad side note, the otherwise wonderful D&D art book Art and Arcana mentions Fifth Age only once, in a tiny sidebar that describes the game only as unpopular among the Dragonlance faithful. Was it as successful as classic DL? Not at all and it was neither timeless nor impactful enough to set itself apart as a game setting. But there were a host of immersive stories in this world, and maybe if it had been given more time, the Age of Mortals could have led to some epic legends of its own. The game was gorgeous, and supplements like the Bestiary remain amongst my favourite world-building texts of all time. I think it was an unfairly maligned and overlooked system that's deserving of another try. But then again, I am neither a lifelong D&Der nor a die-hard Lancer, so my perspective probably gave me a different set of expectations and experiences. But in any case, if you're looking for an innovative game system that takes bold choices, perhaps it's worth giving it a go. Why not leave a comment to let me know what you thought of Dragonlance Fifth Age and the Saga system? Did it take us too far away from classic AD&D gameplay, or was it a breath of fresh air just when we needed it? If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. I really thought I was going to come up with more dragon puns in this script. I guess I'm just burnt out.